what's up everyone welcome back to the long lens podcast this is a podcast where i answer questions from my filmmaking community and we just talk about youtube and filmmaking today i got my buddy uh, matthew dangu on the pod and we're just going to talk a little bit about youtube and filmmaking and how those converge and trying to make it as a youtuber while also running a business so matt how's it going man Dude, I'm stoked to that we got on and do this little podcast today. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. For anyone who doesn't know, uh, Matthew Dangu is a very active YouTuber. He makes a lot of Lumix related content. And I think what a lot of people don't realize about you, though, is that like you're not just a YouTuber. You also run your own uh, video production company in San Diego, right? Yeah. So that, that's the funny part. It's I always get the comments of like, you're just showing off the gear and you're not actually a working professional. I'm like, actually guys, I'm a working professional full time. But if I just showed commercials on YouTube, they just won't perform well at all. That's why I talk about gear. Yeah, exactly. And I think that like, if people go to your website, you like, they'll see that like the stuff that you make is like really, really good. I always like wish that like show more of like your commercial work because it's just like validates your point sometimes or it's just like oh like you shot this super sick you know pickleball commercial or whatever with all the gear that you constantly talk about you know yeah no i i have been thinking about like how can i include my commercial work more into it and it is funny because i just have like hours of bts footage from all of these uh shoots i've been going on so it's like i always hire out pa but instead of just like having them run and go get food i just get the food beforehand so they don't have to i give them a camera i say hey ask people questions film bts film content and then it gives me a bunch of cool b-roll that's one of my favorite content to consume is watching other people work like i don't know if you're like that at all but like i love watching people like do the thing that i'm trying to do as well you know i definitely get a lot of inspiration from like watching like the john carlo bts stuff like oh i'm my absolutely gosh, a huge yeah. fan of seeing that content it just gives you a little bit of a peek behind the curtain almost it's like oh this is what it actually looks like because you know, you could think that he's just, you know, going there with a couple of friends and they're just making this was like, no, there's like, you know, 10 or 12 people and there's people like just, you know, dedicated to lighting and just to the camera. So it's really, it's really cool to see that. Cause I don't know, like, like you probably have a little bit bigger productions than I do, but whenever I have like a crew, it's usually like two people max, you know what I mean? That are helping me with like one of my YouTube videos. Yeah, not including talent. I'm typically running like a three person crew, including myself. But like most commercials for social media, I feel like nowadays need more jacks of all trades and less masters mm -hmm. of one type of situation. So it's like I need someone who's a great AC, but can also like hop on the camera and take over if I need them to. Absolutely. Well, I was going to start it off with something that I've been thinking about lately because I don't know, to me, it is a subject that gets talked about a lot, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on it as someone who has like a, you know, a relatively small channel, at least right now. And that is the idea of burnout. And I guess my first question is like, have you ever been super burnt out with YouTube? Because I know that through my YouTube journey, I can't actually say that I've really gone through, I think what other people have experienced a lot, which is just like, I can't do this anymore. I'm just going to take like a year or two off. I don't think that I've gone that hard with like a burnout season. I think that I've been uploading consistently at least one video per year since 2006. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on, you know, burning out and trying to, you know, grow a YouTube channel. Yeah, no, for sure. I think that for the, when I first started getting going, like I was just excited, wanting to create all the content possible, but over the years of creating consistently content, like Last year, it's like been a video a week. This year, it's almost been two videos a week. The podcast that I have for the Lumix Creators podcast makes it a little bit easier to manage that. But I've definitely felt burnout, but not in the way that most people would feel it in the sense that it's like, oh, I just don't want to make content anymore. It's most of the time it always comes down to if I have to make content, like for example, if I get a product in to talk about and check out and review, the moment I accidentally say yes to one too many products is when I start feeling that like burnout. I'm just like, all right, I just need to get all of this done so I can make the videos that I'm personally passionate about. So I've been trying to get better and better, like filtering what products I say yes to from companies, what products I say no to, and like trying to figure out what's the correct balance. 
now I'm kind of getting to the point where it's like, okay, I only will say yes to products that I personally would purchase with my own money now. And if I wouldn't purchase that with my own money, I don't think I would necessarily make a video on that product to begin with. Or if it's a relationship with a certain company that I really want to keep working with over time, there is those times where I'm like, all right, I'll scratch this company's back because I know they're going to take care of me over time, like for the long run. And it's not trying to like make biased reviews or talk about the products and say positive things necessarily about these products. Like I will still say my honest, thoughtful opinions. I like I made a review on the Comica mic, but like I did notice some issues. So instead of me talking just bluntly about the issues online, I actually just messaged the my rep and be like, hey, I noticed these problems. Are these going to be firmware updates to be fixed? And they're like, oh, we didn't even know this was a problem. Let's try to get those firmware updates fixed. And I still mention those points in the video at the end of the day because they still are a current issue. But yeah, it's just a grind sometimes trying to, you know, late night edits, trying to get organized to host as much content as I can at the end of the day. Yeah, do you still, do you still like get... I don't know, I guess discouraged or I a little bit depressed when a video that you hope does really well, like just bombs. Cause I mean, I like, you know, videos on my channel, they bomb all the time. And especially the ones that I'm most proud of bomb. And so like, I'm always curious if that's like, if like other people feel the same way, I'm sure they probably do, but. Yeah, what's been interesting recently is like with product reviews when they're not L mount or Lumix related on my channel, those videos tend to be like hit or misses. So it's like, I know they're always gambles. So it's, a, I try to justify how much time I'm gonna pit in those videos if I know it's gonna be a gamble. So for example, I did review the map box. I actually, that was pretty cool. It can clamp onto your lens from small rig. I didn't think that video was gonna do really well, but then it got like, you know, 3000 views within the first day or something like that. So I was like, oh, that surprisingly did well. But then, you know, I do a video on a different product and it does, you know, 400 views in a day. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not as bummed about videos I'm not personally attached on. But I do think like the supplement recently of doing podcasts and the podcast videos surprisingly have been doing stupidly well on my channel and the watch time just went crazy with the podcast because I get a ton of watch time on podcasts kind of makes me feel a little bit better because I'm like, oh, people just want to hear conversations with people. And it's a sense of feeling like, oh, I don't know what these two people are about to say during this these 30 minutes. And it makes people more interested in watching that conversation throughout that. So that kind of like makes me feel a little bit better when I can have a low but like low barrier to editing video like the podcast. Yes, it takes a lot of time to edit it, but it's pretty easy to edit. And it typically does really well almost every time. I totally agree with that. I, I mean, for even this podcast, I only started putting it on YouTube, like I think this year, just because some people were saying like, there should be a YouTube version as well. And I think like on my podcast players, I got like 500 to a thousand plays, you know, per episode, but now I've been putting them on YouTube and I'm, I'm ratioing the amount of like subscribers that I have on my channel a lot of the times, which is, which is really nice. So that's cool that like, I mean, that makes a lot of sense that like you can not have yourself attached too much to the videos that you know may or may not do well, but then also know that like the podcast will probably do well and they're very uh, easy to make, I suppose. Yeah, minus the time the episodes take to like produce because if you have an hour long conversation, say you even cut it down to 45 minutes, it still takes you more than 45 minutes to cut that podcast and just listen to everything, pull the best oh, yeah. audio takes. So I'm finally getting to a point where it's a lot quicker because I just, you know, I pit the timestamps as I'm editing the podcast and my captions, and then I'll pit the best things in the beginning as I'm going out. But it's definitely interesting to balance the content that I'm creating with the podcast I'm creating, because I feel like the content talking about video gear, I enjoy to make that a little bit more because it does require just a little bit more skills. With that said, it's more of a gamble if that video does well or not, because it's topical and if it's not an evergreen video it's like a very like more of a niche video um meanwhile conversations i feel like tend to be pretty endless you touched on something a little bit earlier that i know you and anthony talked about a little bit which was the 
sponsored videos, free products, that stuff. I know that's been kind of a, a hot topic in the past couple of months with uh, different people making videos about it. And I'm, I am curious to hear, I know that you and Anthony talked about it a little bit, but I'm always curious to hear people's takes on what's a sponsored video versus what's just a free product that you got sent in, because I have very strong opinions on that whole topic. And I'm going to make a video on my second channel talking about it a little bit, but like, do you think that every free product that you get, you should have to disclaim that you're sponsored by that company just because you got a free product? Or are you in the camp where it's like, I'm not inclined or being, you know, forced to say anything nice. And so this isn't a sponsored review, even though I do get to keep the product for free. Yeah, I, I think I'm probably a little bit in the middle of that, where I think if the company is giving me some product in exchange for video, I wouldn't necessarily, it's a free product because I'm still filming the video. I'm still prepping the video. I'm still editing in it. Even if they don't like, I can say whatever I want in the video. And if that's the case, when I can say whatever I want, I still do think it's worth disclaiming. Like they did send me this product. I didn't have to pay for it. However, I still am putting all the hours, the time, the filming, like if you budget, if you like budgeted all of that out, it would cost way more than what I'm getting for for the product, like majority exactly. of the time, because the average rate for like most going filmmakers, like at least in my area, is like $125 per hour for filming, for editing. So pitting all of that and how much editing time, how much preparation time and how much filmmaking time goes into it is kind of where it's like it's not a sponsored video if they're not forcing me to say anything or even like they're just saying, hey, we'll give you this product, you make a video. I, I'd still do, I still think though it is worth valuing, like, you know, disclaiming somewhat saying like, hey, this company sent me this product, I can say whatever I want with it. But it is also worth noting to the viewers, it's like, I am putting the time into making this video. Of course, there might be a little bit of bias because of that initial excitement of getting this new product. For example, like the Lumix S9, I think is the best example of this year. It's like, I went to Japan. That was my first time out of the country, being a 23 year old at that time. They gave me this camera for long-term loan. Um, and I can say whatever, I didn't have to make a video on it. So in that first video, I did disclaim, hey, I'm in Japan, Lumix sent me this camera, I mentioned bad things about this camera, I mentioned the good things about this camera. But later on, I made more videos about this camera. And I don't necessarily think every single video I have to disclaim, hey, I've been to Japan, <laughs> Lumix sent me this camera. I don't think that's necessary if you make multiple videos on a product. I think the first time, maybe the second time you should mention something when it's that big and like, like that event, I think it's worth mentioning to your viewers to give them that perspective of potential bias. But after that, if you're making, you know, 10 videos about this camera, you're not going to have that necessarily of a bias towards it. I mean, you still will have a bias, but you're not going to be like, I'm saying this because they sent me to Japan. You're like, well, no, I've made 10 videos about this camera because I genuinely enjoy this camera now. No, I feel the exact same way. And that's the thing that like, you know, there've been people like uh, Casey over at Camera Conspiracies. He has very strong opinions about this too. But it's just like, if I get, <clears throat> if I get a $500 lens and I make a video on it, I don't think that that warrants me saying that it's a sponsored video, even if I get to keep the lens. Cause let's just pretend that like your, your rate for an integrated ad read is like 1200 bucks. I don't think that a free $500 lens that even if you tried to sell in the used market, you get maybe 450, you know, for if you're lucky, I don't think that that warrants a, this is a sponsored video. You know what I mean? I think that it's, you know, you should definitely just claim it like, Hey, they gave this to me and I get to keep it, but I can say whatever I want. I definitely think that you should disclaim it, but I don't think that that's the same as being a sponsored video. I don't think that like I don't pay rent with free gear. You know what I mean? I pay rent with, <laughs> with hard earned money. So it's like, that's where I think that there's a little bit of, I don't know, th there's a lot of nuance, I think with, you know, different channels and whatnot. Like, obviously you could argue that like, if I got like a $3,000 camera that I got to keep, maybe that like does warrant a little, you know, sponsored, you know, tag to it. But you know, if you think about anything else in like the professional industry, and I always use like, you know, skateboarding as an example, but it's like, if you were a professional skateboarder and you signed on with a brand, you wouldn't sign on for just free product. You would sign on for a, you know, chunk of money that, you know, you got the contract for. 
So I don't think that it should be necessarily that different for people who have audiences on YouTube either. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna make a whole video about it that's a little bit more flushed out, I hope. But yeah, I'm just like, I'm always curious to, to hear other people's opinions on that because I do think that there is a lot of nuance to it. And there's a lot of people that have very strong opinions about how like anything that you get for free you should, you know, say that it's a sponsored video or whatever. Yeah, no, for for sure. I think it's it's just an interesting like kind of world we're into right now where it's like it's so common for a lot of people and the thing that I think is a big difference with a lot of YouTubers is there's definitely a difference to the creators, you know, when they're getting products for the first time they're gonna definitely be more excited and more kind of giddy about that product versus creators who've been getting free products for over a time. Now it's in a sense, it's like, for your example, okay, they give you a $500 lens, but let's just say it took you maybe 15 hours to plan, um, edit and do everything. In a sense, basically that company should technically owe you $1,000 more in paid if it say it was fifteen hundred dollars, you know, hundred dollars an hour, that company should be paying you a thousand dollars to make it a proper sponsored video. But I think that goes back to the also the idea when you do get free products and if you kind of have that excitement and giddy, I think it is worth noting as a creator, you should know the difference between a proper review and then a showcase. I, I know you've talked about that on your own channel at times too, haven't you? I think that reviews should probably now this is like the weird thing that's like if you're gonna review a product, it can be sent to you for free, but I think that maybe that product should be sent back. If it's if you get to keep it, maybe it can still be a review. I don't know. Like that's why like there's like so much nuance in this because it should be more of like a showcase, and that's kind of how I treat every product that I get. I'm not gonna try to give you an unbiased review because it is biased. Like regardless of how expensive the product is, I got it for free, I get to keep it, it's gonna be biased. You know, there are some products that I don't get to keep like that Laowa uh, zoom lens, I didn't get to keep it, but I still treated it as a showcase and less of a review because I do have a bias towards Laowa. Like they've been sending me lenses for a while now. Like they send me a little, you know, uh, care package during Christmas. Like. I have a bias towards Lawa, whether I want to admit it or not. So that's where I think it's kind of like, but I mean, you know, to your point, like a lot of the, you know, videos that I've made, sure, I get to keep the product, but a lot of the times, like I'm paying for like a BTS guy to come with me. And I'm, you know, like I made some, some videos for DJI and some for, you know, some other companies where it's like, I actually lost money making the videos, but I wanted to make them as good as they possibly could be, you know? So it's like, to your point, to actually pay me and get their product out in front of the 156,000 subscribers that I have should cost them money, but it only costs them the price of the product, which is very, very low. So if anything, I always feel like I'm doing them a favor if they send me a free product that I end up making a video on. Right. And I think that also just comes down to when you get sent a product, like who's the company, what relationships you wanna build with this company over time. And it's obviously in a sense for myself being just a huge Lumix creator, of course, I'm gonna talk about Lumix products, but I'm also not gonna like hold back like what I think could be improved still on future Lumix products. And like, I know there's issues with the Lumix products right now. It's not like I'm oblivious to them, but I just do think it is like, how can you support a company and then they're going to support you back? You know, obviously it's this free products later down the road. Maybe this is going to be more paid sponsorships or integrations and different things like that. But I still think it's valuable at the end of the day, if you are getting a free product, if it's the first video you're making for this product it is still, I think valuable, like disclaiming, like they sent me this product for free, but I'm not having to say anything whatsoever in this video. And it is worth value. It's very valuable, I think, to still mention the cons in that video too. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if it's being treated as a review. Like if you're trying to like just say all the pros of the product and then none of the cons, then yeah, it is kind of it's kind of fishy when people see it's like, oh, okay, you're just you're just praising this product that you got for free and you're not ever you know, saying anything negative about it, then it does feel a little bit more scummy, I think, when people see that like you're just trying to like as camera conspiracies, you know, says, you're just shilling a product essentially. And yeah. I think it's interesting because it's like general storytelling, like one on one. Uh, I'm gonna butcher this so hard. So maybe Nigel will throw a graphic on to explain what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, when you're watching a movie or a YouTube video in the sense, you know, 
it starts off with like that intro and then it's maybe it talks about the price then it's going to talk about the pros of the features like it's going to start building up you're going to start feeling good about the product then it drops off with the cons you know what's going wrong with the like this product you know here's a couple cons and then it levels out will i recommend this product and that's genuinely most product videos on youtube follows this formula with thinking about it or without thinking about it and i'm forgetting what this climax formula is called for proper storytelling but that's like the the rise the fall and like you know all right we had to end up in a better place than we started with in the video and that's the general format that most gear videos kind of just are on youtube are like that now the issue is most people watch the videos and because i think of short form content creation most people watch that intro they get up to the, like the pro advantages and then they stop there and you're like you're such a shill like all you're saying is pro things about this camera you're like wait i was just about to talk about all the cons right now and you just commented before i mentioned that and i don't know if the issue the if there is a solution there because it's hard to, you're just going to talk about negatives in the beginning it, you just seem like a debbie downer and people might click off that so it's kind of a hard thing to to play with. Have you found there be a lot of, I guess, hate comments, I guess, when you do talk about the negatives for Lumix cameras from other Lumix shooters? Oh, interesting. Um, not necessarily because most of the time when I'm bringing up different points, there tend to be like most people agree. I have an entire video. I'm trying to figure out if it's supposed to be a podcast video or just a general video I want on my channel but I want to release it before the next Lumix camera comes out. And it's basically saying like, here's all the weird things I want in Lumix cameras. And these are going to be firmware updates. These are going to be things I'm like, please fix this because it is a little bit annoying to have it. Um, but there is features that I've talked to a lot of different creators where like, we'll just disagree on. Like some people will be like, the Sony menu systems are way better. I'm like, the UI and how that is designed, the colors suck. But those are at the end of the day are just opinions at the end of the day, like on preferences. Like I get how the autofocus works. And I know in some people's videos, like it can like fall off on their faces from time to time, but that's because they're using full area. And it's probably because I have the mindset of contrast based uh, autofocus. I use single area and never had problems of autofocus like falling off my face at all with the new face detect. But there's definitely improvements still with Linux at the end of the day. And I think generally the big improvements that most people agree on tend to not have any like negative, like I think this, you think that, this is how it should be done. I, I don't experience that too much. Like I made one video on my second channel and it wasn't like that I got that much hate, but I got a lot of pushback when I talked about some of the negatives about the S52X. I don't know, that brings me to like, I did wanna ask you a little bit about Lumix cameras just because you're kind of like the Lumix guy. Um, I'm trying what to is be, like, you know? Yeah, like what is like two or three features that you, are either expecting or you hope get put into the hopefully S1H Mark II that's gonna come out hopefully next year. Yeah, so I do have an interesting thought about that is I don't think the S1H would be the first camera that gets released next. I think everyone's like S1H box, box camera is coming next. I, logistically from a marketing perspective, since I do run my own business and I understand marketing, I think the S1 Mark II would probably be the first camera that gets released, but it'll probably have the exact same video features as the G9 Mark II does in that sense. So I'm hoping okay. at the very minimum, at least 4K 60 frames and uh, 4K 120 no crop. I wouldn't even care if 4K 120 had a 10 minute record limit because if you're shooting for more than 10 minutes on 4K 120, you have different problems going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, this is a long shot feature because I know there's a lot of overheating issues when you try to get 6K open gate 48 or 60 frames a second. But I would love to see some type of open gate slow-mo feature that allows you to, even if again, has a 10 minute record limit, I think that would be so huge having a 6K open gate 24 or 60 frames a second feature or functionality in like a 420 10-bit feature. Besides that, you know, 32-bit raw, I mean, 32-bit flow would be great via the XLR2. I would be mm -hmm. shocked if they pit um, the Ari Log 
uh, C3 color profile for a paid upgrade, I'd be pretty shocked if that got into a full frame camera. Because yeah. at that point, you basically have a budget Ari camera. And especially if yeah. they did that in the box style of an S1H Mark II. Um, and then for the S1H, I highly believe that's going to be a box camera. And I think that's for two reasons. The first reason is uh, most people probably don't know, but the BGH-1 has a BGH-1 Mark II that's already released to the public. Um, it's that. just called, yeah, it's called like the AW50. Um, mm -hmm. So I think they did that one because that's more of a broadcast camera and less of a cinema camera. And then two, that allows people not to be confused when the S1H Mark II comes out as a box camera. It kind of distinguishes them like night and day of, all right, this isn't the BGH1 Mark II, this is the S1H Mark II, and it's a box camera. Um, and then the second reason is, I don't, I wanna say it was May of this year, there's a public announcement of a patent that Lumix has on a box camera with a handle. So that's oh. out there in the world already, you know? That's yeah. public knowledge of a patent that, like, that Lumix has. And there is a patent also for ND filters, so that'd be cool too. I mean, that would make a lot of sense, and I agree with you on like like all those points. I definitely think that a slow mo open gate would be sick. I've been doing work for a client that they shoot 4K 60 a lot, but they end up needing to like you know repurpose a lot of their stuff for you know horizontal and vertical. And I've pitched to them like, hey, we should shoot open gate on my S5 2X, and they're just like, well, we need to shoot you know 4K 60 10 bit, and I can't do that in open gate on the s5 2x but it's like man if i could just shoot like 4k 60 10 bit open gate then i could just like solve all their problems for them you know what i mean because it's just b-roll that i'm shooting anyway so it's just like quick clips here and there but it'd be so sick to be able to just like you know give them horizontal and vertical content and yeah i definitely think that it would make sense for the s1h to be a box camera because then it would be a obvious upgrade path for people like me who have the s5 2x if I wanted to get something that was more of like a cinema style body, you know, that one would probably like, I'm assuming it would probably be Netflix approved at some point because the original S1H is, and so is the BGH one, I think. Yeah. Uh, it just depends on the 4k output. I believe mm -hmm. having an OLPF in it too, to, you know, handle the, the more a little bit better. Yeah. I'm interested that you think that the, the S one is going to come out first, which would be, also really cool. I would be really curious as to like how much better it would be. Do you think it would be like leaps and bounds better than my S5 2X? I, I would legitimately think it's like the GH5, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it has yeah. 4K 60. Is that cropped or not cropped? It's not cropped, but it's also not 10 bit. So it's 8 bit gotcha. 4K 60. Yeah. So I would say the GH5, what the GH5 is to, you know, the GH7 is probably gonna be the difference between the S5 2X and the S1 Mark II. So it's like, you'll get, you know, probably, and this is all speculation at the end of the day, and so allegedly, you'll probably get um, 4K 60 frames a second, no crop. Um, hopefully, 4K 120. Now, I, I personally believe there just needs to be something else in this camera that makes it you know, higher than the FX3 and higher than the Sony a7S3 because that camera came out like four years ago. So it's like if Lumix just like after six years, I believe at this point, come out with a camera that matches basically the specs of a camera that came out four years ago, that's like, oh guys, you're six years behind. And then if Sony comes out with something next, that's like, oh, now you're behind again. So I'm really hoping that Lumix figures out something that comes in this camera that makes it leaps and bounds ahead of other camera companies. So, you know, when eventually the other camera companies come out with stuff that catches up to Lumix, Lumix is already, you know, ahead of the game until they are not, and then the next camera comes out. And I don't know what that feature is. I don't think it's 8K. Um, <laughs> RAW would be cool. Yeah, it would probably need to have pretty fast readout speeds too in order to like really be better than the FX3 in at least that regard. I know that there's a lot of people that don't think that it's a big deal, but I think that's one of the reasons why there are still so many like red Komodo shooters is just because of that global shutter. You know what I mean? Right. It's hard to figure out like, okay, what is that next feature that Lynx comes out with? And like I said, I mean, they could easily just go all CF Express type B cards, like, and that's it for the format, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, some people would love and some people would hate, but at the end of the day for video shooters, like 
you just need that at that point for photographers, especially if this is supposed to be more of a photographer centric camera. I could see a lot of those people being like, oh, why did you not just give us two SD card slots? Um, yeah. Or if it was maybe it was a bigger body and had a dual SD cards or dual CF Express Type B cards, like optional. I think that could be potentially a cool option. Well, cool, Matthew. I think I just have one more question for you, and that is, what's your subscriber count right now? Is it like five thousand ish? Um, I think I am about to hit. 5,700 ish. Dang, 5,000. Okay, so you're like 5,700. So what are your goals like right now? Like, do you have any like, I mean, I think it's kind of, it's almost fruitless to set like subscriber goals because you can't, I mean, you can affect it, but it's like, you know, I've always said that like, it's, it, you know, makes more sense to focus on like what you're going to create as opposed to like what you hope to gain. But like, what are your, I guess, what are your YouTube goals right now as like 5,700 subscribers in the next like five years? What do you hope to accomplish on YouTube? Right. Yeah. It is funny though, that you said that subscriber goals are funny because my subscriber goal <laughs> this year was 5,500. So I passed oh, really? that. Um, yeah. But I, I like setting like if I set number goals like that, I like setting action steps um, throughout the entire year. So it's like I had like a bunch of goals at the start of 2024 and then I had action steps and then I make quarterly goals and then the action steps to my quarterly goals every single like quarter just to kind of help me push myself along. So this last year was to work double as much time on YouTube. And I did that in dedicating a whole YouTube day, posting two time, two videos a week. And in return from 2023 to 2024, I literally doubled, if not tripled all my views, all my watch time hours and monetization, literally everything expanded. But kind of going forward, the goals for my personal channel, of course, growing in subscribers is great, but and I love you guys. If you want to subscribe, great, you should. I, I think my personal goals for YouTube is I would eventually love to see YouTube becoming a bigger engine in my business, like generating more revenue, selling more uh, digital products. So like I just dropped film LUTs for the natural color profile for Phase Detect Lumix cameras. So I definitely want to see myself growing in that aspect of doing more email marketing, growing that, growing the sponsorship side of YouTube, because the more I can invest into making cool YouTube videos with sponsor integrations, I feel like the more time I can put into the videos because it's actually paying me more money in a sense versus, you know, just spending my time sort of for free because I know it's an investment of my time right now for the payoff in, you know, the next few years. But it'd be great to, it would be hard to see this, but it'd be great to see basically a double next year, at least in terms of, you know, views, monetization, subscribers. So it'd be great to see a double and triple effect, you know, for the next couple of years, which I don't know what that means because I don't think I can post more content than I am right now because I'm uh, getting close to maxing out on how much content I could like physically handle without the financial return. Absolutely. Well, dude, I mean, I think that you're, you're really uh, inspiring me to like grind a little bit harder on YouTube because I see how much you're putting out and like that's definitely something that I I see you accomplishing next year for sure. Yeah, man, I think that's that's all I kind of had uh, you know planned for this podcast. If anyone wants to check out Matthew's channel, I'm gonna definitely have it linked in the show notes below. Matthew's been getting some pretty heavy hitters on his podcast too, so you should definitely go check that out. Uh, Matthew, is there any other place that you want to send uh, the the viewers of this channel? I guess, yeah, besides the YouTube channel, Matthew Daniel on YouTube, um, if you want to check out my professional work, you can go to 4x3films on Instagram or 4x3films.com and that like shows all my professional work on what I actually do full time and make a living off of. And his stuff is really good, so definitely go check that out. Anyways, uh, thanks Matthew, it was really fun talking to you and I'm probably gonna have you on again in the future. Sweet, thanks man. Cool, later. <laughs>